Thank you all uh, for coming. I'd like to uh, talk uh, about a project called the Urban Songlines. It's been a project that I've been doing for the last uh, six years after uh, reading Bruce Chetwin's book on the Songlands that describes how the Australian uh, Aboriginals sing the shape of their landscape, uh, not only in tone but also in language, um, to map and spiritual connect and manage the land that they live in. So the idea is that um, through the technological, uh, topographical description of the land, you're able to navigate it. And um, by singing of the land, the Aboriginals believe that the land only exists if you sing the physical properties of it whilst you travel through it. So for me to get to the camera, um, I would have to sing that I'm passing the turntables, the chairs, the projector, in order to sing of the land, as they call it, to call into existence this land, uh, to be able to traverse it. Now for me, um, this intricate relationship that the Aboriginals have with their land uh, was for me a good metaphor to see if we could use that in the built environment, in public space, in order to think how we relate to public space, how we can appropriate public space, and how we um, can think of new possibilities of, of, uh, of how to use public space. Use and misuse it. Um, I'm going to give a, a number of examples of projects that I did, going from recent to, uh, to less re uh, recent, and to see how much uh, we can cover. Um, and then I'll leave some considerable time for uh, conversations. Um, first project that I would like to highlight is a project that I did uh, recently in Istanbul. This building that you uh, see here is called Perilil Kush, which means the haunted house. And uh, the idea was that the waves that are in front of this uh, building, um, splashing up to the shore, um, describe a, a sort of a, a graphical representation of music. So what I did in a graphical synthesizer, I traced the lines of the waves splashing up on the shore and I play those shapes by uh, tracing them in the graphical synthesizer and play them as a musical score. Now, the symphony that was created that you can hear in the top tower uh, on vinyl spinning there uh, was uh, dispersed over five layers of the building with different uh, compositional segments of the symphony going from lower registers to higher registers uh, tracing different waves uh, that splash up on the shore. I'll give a little bit of an example of that. Okay. So the idea is that in all of the projects that we're going to see, uh, that um, I take a specific uh, location uh, where they invite me to come and do a project. Um, locally, I uh, find a dynamic that represents that place and allows me to create site-specific sound. With the site-specific sound, I create music in different forms, as we will see in collaborating with dancers, for example, or skateboarders. Um, or using sonar dolphin echolocation devices to create uh, profiles of the physical shape of the building. As the aboriginals would sing the shape of the land, I'm trying to translate architecture and objects in public space into music through site-specific sound generation.
of the five uh, registers that were dispersed over the five layers of the tower that then together on vinyl uh, were, created, were collected as a symphony in the top tower. Uh, overseeing the entire uh, Bosporus between the Black Sea and the Marmara Sea, which generated the sound waves that then became the music. So, in fact, you're looking at the water that creates the view of, uh, of the music. Um, this project, um, done for public space in Tbilisi, um, I I had to prepare on this and so I had to look for objects in public space in Google Earth and this uh, element uh, of architecture, as the local architect calls it, um, was supposed to be a uh, bench, a public bench, it's not used like that, but these are seats and um, it was uh, supposed to be a place where DJs could perform, but it was never used like that, so I was the first one after a year of existence to do that. And I found this ancient musical uh, score uh, of a m movie, and um, I used this uh, machine. Uh, she designed this, the architect designed this building, uh, or this bench, as a uh, imitation of Tom and Jerry's piano, where they run up and down chasing each other in the piano and, the, and it makes a wavy uh, form, the hammers. So I see this as a musical instrument that coupled, that coupled with the, uh, the score that became uh, live uh, danceable elements. Um, these are pillows that you can use to sit on the cushions to sit on the bench and the dancers create new notes within this score system and I play in a graphical synthesizer once again the physical shapes that they're holding up so I'm playing a circle and rectangles and triangles and squares and it sounds more or less like this Rose, 
and she uh, is um, waiting for him to return because after decades of being placed in different areas um, around the world, he was planning on going back, but he never uh, reached Istanbul back, and she didn't know, and she died of a broken heart, and is still seen roaming the gardens of this consulate. And in the chapel, in the church, I uh, asked local trumpet players to create a, um, a song for her, to accompany her in her nightly roaming of the garden uh, as a ghost, and we used the disused um, organ pipes um, that remained in the church uh, as a memory of the past, and they used them in different ways um, to create a soundtrack for it, for which we shall listen to a little segment.
So, in uh, another example, uh, this is the Fundazione Pistoletto in, it in Italy. Um, what I found in this old textile factory is the uh, imprints of the machines on the floors, which I used together with a local collaborator who found me a round stone from the river to play uh, these patterns as a um, possible re-instruction to uh, play the um, golden records as they are placed in Voyager 1 and 2. The golden records were um, discs, uh, were actually golden uh, records that were um, inscribed to be played by aliens who would find them of our extraterrestrial life. And the instruction of the records that contain greetings in many languages, animal sounds, etc. Uh, this was a project designed by Carl Sagan. And um, the instructions were completely to what I think we would interpret now as quite arbitrary because it says to a intelligent life that we might not know if they have physical shape, we might not know if they can read or have eyes or how they would interpret the signs, but basically the golden record says there is a groove uh, in this record that if you put a needle in and you connect it to a little square box and amplify that wave that comes out, you'll have the sound to play this record. And I found it such a beautiful, a kind of uh, arrogant position uh, of us thinking in 1974, they'll figure it out, we'll just make a little drawing and these blobs of energy uh, will, you know, they'll, they'll know how to play a record. And so uh, I designed this um, similar patterns that I found as um, played by the stone that rolled over it uh, as, a, as an alternative instruction to play these golden records. Might uh, intelligent life uh, find us one day? And that sounded more or less like this. So again, to make scientific sound and make the music literally be a representation of the shape of the space, uh, the sounds are always only generated locally and uh, recorded with a handheld recorder and then transformed with software into music. So there's no added sound, it's only the physical space itself and the tools uh, like that's or in this case a pebble that creates the sound that made it to be. Moving on, this is uh, a uh, building that is under construction. Um, I was asked to make an interpretation for that empty space. Uh, it's a large uh, circular empty space um, in Rockville, um, Maryland. These uh, are the uh, 
the uh, roller derby girls, local uh, the roller derby team that were given these highly reflective costumes that normally are the stripes on security vests and um, security material in public space. And the idea was that uh, they were going around in total darkness and you had to flash your uh, phone flashlight at them to be able to activate them in the dark space. And it was a uh, metaphor for the possibilities of the buildings, uh, almost a Heisenberg um, uncertainty principle that they could be anywhere around you at any given moment and you had to flash to see where they were. So to call them into existence you had to activate them via their costumes. And you can only see it from your point of view because the material only reflects back straight to you and not to the person that's standing next to you. And so as they were going uh, around the building, these are some pictures of the rehearsals, but it was pretty dark. Thank you, Google. Uh, it was pretty dark when the audience um, had to activate them with their own uh, devices. And that sounded more or less like this. of the electromagnetic uh, uh, radiation, the electromagnetic field that's created by the building, the wires in the walls, and through the people touching um, the copper wire, we create a collective field of the users of the building and the building itself, which was then connected and measured by an oscilloscope, which is then played by a invited musician on Moog uh, synthesizer. So we played the graphical uh, shape on the monitor on the oscilloscope that is literally the representation of the electromagnetic field created by the building and the people touching the copper wire that snaked through uh, the building and that sounded and looked like this.
Um, this is an installation that is made out of 500 records. It's uh, the sound of me um, entering a um, derelict cinema uh, through the roof. The curators had access to it before, but they lost the permission in the end to uh, work with the building anymore. But anyway, we entered via the roof and the sounds recorded by entering to the building and going to the projector room and finding within the projector room the last movie that was played um, and taking sound fragments of that together with the movement through the building became the soundtrack for the uh, pavilion that represents the building as sound and the idea was that the people could one by one take these vinyls home the instructions on the wall was take a vinyl home and through that vinyl that of all the other projects, the vinyls uh, are given away to DJs for free. So the DJs, by an act of sampling, can uh, distribute the spaces that are made into music through this process of, uh, of dissemination through sampling. In this case, the audience uh, could take one home and deconstruct this building or this pavilion that represented that they are like cinema that was the subject of the translation and take it home uh, piece by piece and destruct it in that sense. Um, we'll move on to the Rosenthal uh, Contemporary Art Center in Cincinnati, one of the earlier projects of Zaha Hadid. She uh, built this uh, under the concept that she called um, urban carpet. So the idea is that the floor starts outside the building, runs through a glass cube, that's the lobby of the building, with two large black hanging staircases in them. <coughs> they were made by a roller coaster company at the end. The spine of the building is formed by this slope, almost a skateboard ramp, that then follows and becomes it's kind of this material, exactly this material, that goes all the way up to the roof. And I instantly saw that space as a marble game to which I invited uh, local dancers and gave them these weather balloons to actively reenact the marble game within that space. So, in this case, I run around, record the sounds whilst we start up the video. I record the sounds of the balloon rolling up and down the stairs and bouncing off the walls, and the dancers chasing them and re re oh. I'm sorry, this is number 20. So all the sounds that you hear are recorded in that space. This is the balloon bouncing off the wall. So I record those sounds live, make music out of it, and then perform that music to which the dancers dance again. Uh, taking the dialogue with the building, creating uh, a piece of music that we can put together. Then eventually goes on to vinyl and is given away to the coffee tea uh, and tobacco factory in Rotterdam called the Vanilla Factory and here I used contact mics and the audience in the old switch box that were able to uh, create the sound of this mechanism which I then played for uh, a 48 hour concert. Um, 
I'm going to skip to uh, this project uh, here. It was a, a matrix printer. This is the um, gallery space, the, the floor plan of the gallery space in Buenos Aires, where uh, Jorge Luis Borges wrote the story of Sloan Mukbar and Orbis Tertius, in which he describes the concept of a run, which is when you have a pencil and you lose it and you might find it back and somebody else might find it back and one is the original object and the other is a creation uh, of imagination uh, it's a fictional object that is a real object that um, has slightly different physical properties it could be slightly longer or uh, wider and it's described in the story uh, there are seven degrees of these known here described in the story and asked the local designer to redesign the space as a architectural floor plan and print them out by a matrix printer that then creates a site specific description of that space uh, because the matrix printer in its zooming uh, physically describes that drawing and that was then made into music. This is the storefront for art and architecture in in uh, New York, uh, a space mm, designed with uh, 13 pivoting uh, facade elements that I connected to <coughs> uh, a mile of surgical wire with contact mics on the wall and you could play that space uh, by tuning as an instrument, by tuning uh, the space by moving these panels that had their uh, cables connected to it and then you could play it as a string element, you could plug it and that looked more or less like this
example, and then we'll go over to uh, discussion if needed. <coughs> mm. This is a bridge in Bratislava where, uh, from the observation deck, you were not allowed to look to the free west, which was Vienna, uh, until recently. And you were only allowed, so the direction we're looking at here was sealed off. Uh, you could only look at uh, Br uh, Bratislava, the city itself. And uh, when they opened it up, people could, for the first time, see from Bratislava the free west, which was Vienna, the closest city uh, nearby. So I recorded the sounds of the bridge itself, and then uh, sent that file to Radio Free uh, 94.0 in Vienna. Uh, that was a revolutionary radio station. And during the performance, we received that uh, signal back of that sound of the bridge being played over the radio, which I then recorded and made into live uh, music there. So there's a dialogue between the Free West uh, and the concept of the script and uh, the people looking at the direction where the radio station is. I'm going to skip to the final example, which is the very first. Uh, this is echolocation in which audience members, uh, volunteers use uh, clicking devices to navigate through the auditorium uh, of a museum and uh, have to find their way uh, through listening their way through the echoes um, very much as a bat would do or a dolphin. And from that mapping of the space I made recordings live and created music that is the representation of the mapping of the space through uh, echolocation device. Final example, this is one example of the vinyls that goes to the DJ. And this uh, is the very first one I did after I came back from Australia to study the song lines uh, as created by the Aboriginals. And I'm just going to play this one entirely for our entertainment. So again, all the sounds that you hear are fully created digitally um, from real recordings of the skateboarder. In this case, discovering the building, navigating it through the tracks and existing marks of the building.
So I would like to open up uh, the floor for questions, conversation, doubts, remarks. Yes. So, Lark, every every time we approach a project, it's completely from scratch. From scratch, yes. The idea is that uh, the projects are site specific, so for me, the energy has to come from that local place. Collaborators are, uh, in one way or the other, always connected with that space. So, their knowledge and their interpretation of how to do the space uh, comes largely from the collaborators. So, the dancers, for example, get a few elements of script and the, how they do the literal interpretation comes in a big part from that. Yeah. And so the skateboard uh, identity. Have you ever uh, tried to amplify a building so that you can hear what is below the threshold of your end? No, but that's uh, something that I want to do and it's definitely on my list of methods to, uh, to interpret the building. Um, and um, it didn't happen yet, but uh, I'm sure to contact you when we're going to do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That'd be great. Especially a really resonant yeah. space so we can have things that are below the threshold that you hear get up to that threshold and then also resonate in the space. Oh, that'd be fantastic, yeah, because I'm. I'm I'm very interested in sub, uh, subsonic uh, sounds because they're called everything under the 20 hertz threshold mm -hmm. that we know here. And uh, I know that there is certain frequencies that uh, put you in certain moves that you use for warfare. Uh, and so it's an interesting uh, subject. We should definitely do that project. Okay. Yeah. Chris? Um, this might be a question about your compositional process. Yes. Um, Listening to a lot of these, the, the, the results of these projects um, and taking all these different kinds of env environmental sounds that you're working with, um, there's these interesting periodicities that start to, that I'm hearing in all of this, that I'm, I'm wondering how many of those, like these pulsations or these, these metric kinds of, 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 of phenomena, and I wonder how much of that was, was there in the the source materials that you were coming across, like were these sorts of periodicities there in the in the recorded sounds, or was that a compositional <laughs> decision to to move it in that direction as you were manipulating the materials? Yeah, I think that some of them are uh, there. Uh, they're largely created by uh, manipulating the sound, so it's all uh, effects that don't introduce sounds from the outside, but it's all. Uh, modulation of pitch and sound and speed and, and echoes and reverberations and they're all introduced in a quite intuitive way because I believe that also for me these spaces are not uh, to be read that accurately that I would be able to make a very um, exact construction sonically out of it but, but I work with that space up to the very moment that I uh, perform it, the music it's kind of a process of learning and learning about that space, learning about my collaborators, the process of the dance, or how a skateboarder interprets the space. And then the very last moment, everything comes together, and I compose it in, a, in an intuitive way, based on a trial and error and hearing what works and what doesn't work. Does that answer? Any other questions? Well, you sort of go through the spectrum of the recordings that you have, and you see which one, uh, which ones work, and which one uh, don't work. And there's definitely uh, many sounds that are that don't exactly fit to what you want to be using, and so you discard it. It's often uh, it's often very small segments that are elaborated uh, widely. Uh, you can create, I think, whole albums uh, out of, you know, single one-second soundbite. Uh, yeah. uh, otherwise, sometimes it's the whole thing uh, as it comes out and, and that's played live. So, for example, with the graphical, the one with the pillows, that's something that you play out once live and... You,
you probably never do it again and it's a single one time that you, that you play it but as you're making the graphical shapes uh, tracing those shapes in a graphical synthesizer uh, that's an uncut piece, there is no editing in that it's just as it comes out because the, the lines are really sharp in the graphical. Do you find that it kind of, does it bother you at all that you follow the entire shape of the way that you draw those points? Like, does it change? The, the lines that you're drawing could it be more contour around the shape? Yeah, there's the limitation of this graphical synthesizer that's 15 points. So you have to divide that sound wave over 15 elements. And if we have a single one, you can trace it more accurately. And in this case, it's the limitation of, of what you can do with that software. Nice layering, this interruption was beautiful because it was a comment on the, the child probably making noise in another performance. And the comment was creating noise in itself. Right, right. So it was a layering, talking about noise. And then noise interrupts, that's describing other noise that it was making in other places. So that's a beautiful uh, conjugation of, of descriptions of sound right there, which I really like. And I think the objective of the whole project, in a sense, is to allow us to think different about, differently about spaces by listening to architecture, by listening to objects in public space, um, and therefore change our perspective of how we can use them and how we can appropriate these spaces. I have one more idea for you. Please. Um, so, you know, to the extent a building might exist in a, like a really loud urban environment, and, and one of the things it does is it protects against the elements, right? And one of the elements might be sound. Uh, so what if you sort of turn a building inside out and actually amplify the out, the exterior of the building into the building and really charge it up with all the sounds outside manipulate that. That's a real interesting, that's a real interesting uh, thought. Yeah, one project that I skipped, uh, I worked with a uh, electroacoustic ensemble uh, district full from Manchester and I asked them to make an infinite crescendo because we were in this bunker space in Istanbul where uh, in the architectural faculty they test materials for soundproofness uh, in this super big double steel door bunker and so this crescendo that was a very tough one I put inside of the space, closed the doors with the audience outside we amplified it to the max, the whole building was shaking I recorded inside, and then opened the doors and then I manipulated that uh, echo uh, or that resonance of that space I manipulated that through one single filter uh, in Ableton Live that described the protest of the day before of the uh, the people in the room, the students in the room who are actually the protesters, and how a physical route of them would go around Taksim Square where the protests were going on, and how they would migrate around the police without um, actually fighting because it was a passive uh, defense of the Turkish students, uh, and that created some crazy emotions in the room because not only was the music very, very tough and um, uh, also the emotions were strong because they were holding back all that aggression because they were in a passive process and in that bunker, in that free zone downstairs uh, they had the possibility to let their, uh, let their emotions go and there were, there were people crying and there were heavy conversations after that was interesting but to purely bring the sound outside and do something like that, compress the inside, completely sealed off from the outside, and then hyper compress it from the inside, that's a super one. Definitely gonna go in on that one too, Brian. Thank you for your ideas. Yeah. Well, thank you uh, all. If there's no further questions, I want to thank you for your valuable time. And uh, yeah. Collaborations to be continued. Thank you so much. Thank you.